Scarothorax merch is now available on the Edge Redbubble. Links in the description and comment section below. Ever had the sneaking suspicion that there's something in the toilet ready and waiting to strike at your bits? Not something most of us think about anymore, unless living in a place with local wildlife that have a general indifference to the presence of humans. That being said, there was once a creature that remained undetected at the bottom of rivers, opening its toilet seat shaped head whenever something tasty swam by. You wouldn't make the mistake of taking a seat on this throne though, as Garothorax would surely take the opportunity to take a chunk out of you. The story of Garothorax, like most ancient amphibians known for a century or more, is twisty and locked out of the internet or behind a foreign language. The story technically goes all the way back to the late 1800s when the first fragment of the creature was found. However, it wasn't seen for what it was till the 1940s, so we'll get to it when we get to it. The first described remains of this animal were found in Germany and named in 1934 as Garothorax pulcherimus. They were described and named by Scandinavian quaternary scientist Tage Nielsen, who gave the animal its name from the derived word garo, referring to a wicker basket, and thorax, referring to the chest and pulcherimus being a word that may translate to very or rather beautiful. I cannot gain access to the original paper by Nielsen on these German specimens since I couldn't find it anywhere, plus it's probably in Swedish, Danish, or a list of five other languages. It doesn't really change up the story much, so let's go on to the stuff we do have a lot of info on. The next specimens were from Sweden and were given a new species name to differentiate them from the other specimens. Nilsson was back again as the guy who described them and gave them the name Garothorax Rachicus in 1937 in yet another paper I cannot access. The first specimen of this second species was first collected in 1933 in the southernmost historical province of Sweden, Scania, specifically in the Biav municipality. That find contained most of the body proper plus some bits of shoulder, ribs, and armor. Earlier, I brought up how the critter's story goes all the way back to 1885, and that's because a specimen of Garothorax was found all the way back then, but was just a chunk of the back of the noggin. So nothing was done about thoroughly describing it or giving it a name until more were found many decades later. This early find was stashed in the Paleozoological Department at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in Stockholm and was found in the same place as the holotype specimen. Both of these fossils come from the Bjov municipality and were excavated from gray, clay-saturated sandstone rocks, which lay 40 to 60 centimeters above a very important layer of coal. This layer of sandstone belongs to the Ratian stage of the late Triassic epoch, making these guys some of the last giant temnospondyl amphibians to exist. Another specimen of the Raetica species would be found in the same layer of rock, but not the same locality in the mid-1930s. This specimen was then described in 1946 by Tage Nielsen in conjunction with the previous two finds, allowing a much more fleshed out idea of what the animal looked like and what its physiology may have been like. The 1946 specimen contained much more of the entire body of the second species than either the holotype or the 1885 specimen, with three slabs containing the back of the skull, the throat skeleton, a bunch of backbones from the neck, back, pelvis, and tail, the shoulder girdle, some parts of the pelvis, bits of the leggies, and some back armor. Many more specimens of this great beast would be found in as incomparable of places as Greenland and Thailand. Let's start with Thailand. The remains of a large amphibian were first uncovered in Thailand in 1984 during a Thai-French paleontological expedition organized by the Department of Mineral Resources of Bangkok and the National Museum of Natural History of France. The phibian bones were locked away in a block of carbonaceous black shale making the process of removing the rock quite a pain in the rear. In order to get past that hard rock, the scientists had to use acid, specifically diluted formic acid. The fossil was found in the Hoi Hien Lat formation, which dates to the late Triassic, which matches with the other known Garothorax remains. 
In order to get the bone out with acid, they set the specimen in the acid bath, then removed it and washed the acid off, before applying a protective layer of schmutz to any bone peeking out of the rock, letting that harden, then putting the thing back in acid, and then repeating till most or all the rock was gone, and you're left with the fossil. The bone from Thailand belongs to the clavicle of the animal, and since it was just a single chunk, the team couldn't confidently place it in a specific genus or species. Despite this, they did heavily compare it to both Garothorax and its relative Plagiosaurus, and it matches up pretty well. Those fossils of the wide-mouthed toilet head from Greenland would be uncovered in the 1990s. The team responsible for their description tried to place it in any other group, but couldn't. The bones were too similar to those found in Germany and Sweden. These remains come from the Fleming Fjord formation of eastern Greenland, which dates to the late Triassic, like most of the Garothorax rocks. The material from Greenland is extensive, with several three-dimensionally preserved skulls, known with far less complete non-noggin bones, but it doesn't matter now since there are so many specimens of this beast known. Over the years, many species have been set up to name different specimens from different regions. Garothorax pustuloglomeratus, Franconius, plus the one I threw out earlier, Raticus. The only one to survive to today has been Garothorax pulcherimus. With a bunch of names came a bunch of researchers to find that they really cannot be split up so easily. All have been sunk into a single species. Garothorax therefore represents, in at least one team's paper, an example of evolutionary stasis. That means the critter has stayed looking relatively the same for a very long time. This was proposed because all specimens share most of the same characteristics, but range drastically in geography and in time from the Middle Triassic to the Late Triassic, a time span of 35 million years. Species don't typically last that long without changing things up to adapt to changes in environment. Stuff like this doesn't mean the group stopped evolving because obviously they did over those 35 million years, but it means they were adaptable enough to remain in their evolutionary lane for as long as that lane existed. Speaking of which, what the hell is this thing and what was it doing with its toilet seat head? But first, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to show you just how big this honkin' chonker was. With all known specimens combined, a good estimate of the max sizes these things could possibly attain have been calculated at about a meter, 3.3 feet long. Since these critters weren't hollow boned, and since they were so long, I wouldn't be surprised if they were some really hefty chonkers. I'm actually pulling this out of nowhere, but since the largest living amphibians can reach about 60 pounds, 27 kilograms, and a bit longer, Garothorax could have easily reached 40 pounds, 18 kilograms, or more. As you can see, one of Garothorax's most distinctive features is that the whole thing was super flat. These guys were pretty much pancake bear traps. Their torsos were super wide with belly ribs, which in this case may be called a gastral basket that helped provide strength to its underside and may have aided the creature in breathing. Along its back and probably embedded in its skin were extensive plates of bony armor. These things weren't like the super thick, ultra hard armor of the ankylosaurian dinosaurs or mammalian armadillos, but it would have kept the thing semi protected from attacks from above. Like some other Paleozoic and Mesozoic armored amphibians, Garothorax may have needed the armor for structural support as well. It had a huge shoulder girdle clavicle mess near the front of its body that some average length limbs attached to. The pelvic girdle was smaller, but the hind limbs were slightly larger than the front. The feet were a bit larger and spread wider apart, suggesting it used those more for propulsion or steering than the front limbs. The neck contained extremely robust and hardened bones, called the hyobranchial apparatus. These bones provided structural support for the tongue, throat, neck, and jaw muscles. Near or within the hyobranchials are the serratobranchials. The serratobranchials are the structural support for gills. The presence of the serratobranchials means the critter had a pair of gills for breathing. This means it was also pedomorphic, 
which is an evolutionary process by which an organism prolongs its juvenile stage or some juvenile features past sexual or skeletal maturity. For example, the living axolotl, Ohm, and Ma puppy retain large feathery gills and fish-like fins that are usually traits of the juvenile stage of their relatives. They never naturally fully mature into typical salamander-shaped amphibians. Another example of this is us. Our young look an awful lot like the young of our closest relatives, chimps and bonobos. We retain some of those features into adulthood too. So, the gill trait left in Garothorax is a trait usually seen only in the juvenile state of animals like it. When these gill bones were originally described back in 1946, they were thought to correspond to feather-like external gills like in those ever-young axolotls. Later research in the 2010s found that this reconstruction is incorrect. They found that Garothorax and its relatives had a bunch of weird grooves in their gill bones. Grooves in the gill bones can be found in modern and ancient fish. In these fish, the gill bone grooves mean internal gills. No modern amphibian has grooves in the gill bones. Their results showed that Garothorax and company were more likely to have internal gills. This is also a good adaptation for large animals as huge feathery gills would be out all willy-nilly, super easy to rip and tear. Small animals with those gills can easily regrow bits that get ripped off and just have less of it overall. These big critters could keep their internal gills protected by large skin folds. Another super obvious and unique feature of Garothorax was its head. The skull is way too flat and wide, just like the body, with the obnoxious eye sockets facing upwards. The head is semicircular in shape with the corners tipped by slightly recurved crests, similar to Diplocallus, though far less extreme. The teeth were large and robust, meaning that mouth meant business. If we open its mouth, we'll see what kind of business that was. The lower jaw was rimmed by evenly spaced, slightly recurved, bullet-shaped teeth tipped by blunt but pointy caps. The skull, on the other hand, had tightly packed teeth that were much thinner. On the roof of the mouth were what is called palatine teeth, and they were much larger than the rest of the teeth, effectively functioning as fangs to make sure anything that got in there stayed there. Yet another super cool feature to this big flat f is how its skull attached to its fat neck. You see, the joint that connects the skull to the neck was really knobby. Like, so knobby that it allowed the skull to articulate up to a 50 degree angle. Meanwhile, the lower jaw was a bit squeaky. It couldn't open as wide as lower jaws usually open. This meant that when the animal opened its jaws to the widest extent, it was the skull that was opening widest and doing all the work, rather than the jaw. Okay, cool, but like, why? Well, such a wide flat body, wide flat head, bare trap teeth, internal gills, strong muscular neck and throat, all combined with jaws that opened upwards like a toilet seat, should mean that this animal lived most, if not all of its life, on the bottom of streams, ponds, and lakes. Just so happens that every single specimen of Garothorax is found in rock deposits which represent what would have been the bottom of rivers, creeks, ponds, and... Lake. Normally, you can't confidently connect the animal you find with where it was buried since animals get moved about all over the place once they die. But when you find a critter with nothing but aquatic adaptations in freshwater rock deposits, you can more confidently put two and two together. Garothorax were most likely content to lay at the bottom of bodies of water, with their entire bodies buried beneath the sludge that blanketed the murky depths. Either they kept their mouths permanently open like alligator snapping turtles do today, until prey came close and they snapped, or they opened their mouths in an instant and used suction forces to inhale their prey, before they even had a chance to realize what had happened. Garothorax is usually the commonest fossils found in the rock layers where they are found, making it a little difficult to fully flesh out the world in which they lived. Despite the lack of really good remains of the diversity of life there must have been, there are some indications. 
On top of those indications, we can get a generalized idea of the types of animals that lived with Garothorax by comparing the known environment of Garothorax with those from the same time period but different locations. Therefore, you could be reasonably certain some form of early life theropod dinosaurs were skulking around looking for small animals to nab. Those small animals were probably some forms of lungfish, lizard, insect, arachnid, or small amphibian. Lungfish and small brackish water sharks have been found near the Greenland specimens of Garothorax, so small forms of them may have been on the menu for our toilet head. Early turtles, like Proganochiles, have also been found in the Greenland deposits. These guys were heavily armored and probably acted a little bit like a cross between modern tortoises and turtles, meaning it is possible it met the toilet-headed monsters but probably wasn't a common occurrence. During this time, the largest, most dangerous inhabitants of the waterways were the phytosaurs. They were crocodile-like archosaurs unrelated to the crocodilians of today. They convergently evolved their crocodilian good looks, but could get quite a bit bigger, with some up to the size of killer whales. Some bits of them have been found in the Greenland rocks, but were more or less worldwide in distribution throughout the Triassic period. Newly described early sauropodomorph Ishi would have acted as the largest terrestrial organisms in the Greenland area with other early sauropodomorphs and some rhino-sized synapsid dicynodonts rounding out those niches throughout the rest of the Garothorax range. These enormous terrestrial herbivores used their teeth and beaks to fill their cavernous guts with all sorts of vegetation, stuff like ferns, ginkgos, horsetails, and glossopterids. Cycads were also a possible favorite snack of the vegetarian titans. None for our flat friend Garothorax, though. They were content with wallowing in the muck, waiting for worms, fish, or crustaceans to make one wrong move. Garothorax belonged to a very long-lived order of amphibians called the Temnospondyli. These animals were a good bit different from any modern-day amphibian, which belonged to the Lysamphibia. As in most things, experts have their disagreements on these amphibians. It remains a little unclear whether they were the ancestors of modern amphibians or if they were a sister group which died off with no living descendants. Some recent studies have found that modern amphibians branched off a group called the amphibimids, which also branched off from the temnospondyl group, meaning modern amphibians are more like cousins rather than true direct descendants. Garothorax, therefore, has a lot of characteristics it inherited from its ancestors that differ a great deal from the modern amphibians. Many of these temnospondyls were fully capable of surviving in salt water, others in brackish water, while most remained in fresh water. True, some modern amphibians are able to tolerate brackish water, but none thrive in it throughout their lives. Garothorax has been firmly shoved into the group called Plagiosauridae as part of the larger Plagiosauroidea. No Garothorax cousin were quite as stubby or had quite the head, but were all big flat creatures with big wide mouths they used for similar attacks on prey items. Its family includes Megalothalma, Plagiosternum, Plagiosaurus, Plagioscutum, and Plagiobatrachus. Garothorax shows that even some things survive enormous mass extinctions. The Demnospondyls were extremely diverse during the Permian period, but got knocked down a few pegs when the Great Dying occurred. Those that eked through the extinction thrived in the Triassic period as they had little competition. Unfortunately, they mostly died out during the Triassic extinction event. The only ones to survive were those living in extremely isolated pockets of the world, like the giant enigmatic Kulasuchus of Australia. That's all I got for you on the toilet head salamander Garothorax. I think we should try to get that common name to catch on. Who's with me? Before we get down to the nitty gritty, I want to thank my animators Adam Mitsuk or Kuzim and Tyler Addison for the animations in this video. If you like their work, consider following them on Twitter. Links in the description and comment section below. Now, on with the show. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.
Special thanks goes to my Elephant Tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.